are now in the next topic, the back. Under back is the vertebral column. The vertebral column is the central bony pillar of the body. It supports the skull, pectoral girdle, upper limbs, and thoracic cage. By way of the pelvic girdle, transmits body weight to the lower limbs. Composition of vertebral column. It is composed of 33 vertebrae, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, and 4 coccygeal. Next, we have the general characteristics of a vertebra. A typical vertebra consists of a rounded body anteriorly and a vertebral arch posteriorly. This enclosed a space called the vertebral foramen, through which run the spinal cord and its coverings. The vertebral arch consists of a pair of cylindrical pedicles, which form the sides of the arch, and a pair of flattened laminae, which complete the arch posteriorly. Characteristics of a typical cervical vertebra The spines are small and bifid. The body is small and broad from side to side. The vertebral foramen is large and triangular. Characteristics of the atypical cervical vertebrae The first, second, and seventh cervical vertebrae are atypical. First cervical vertebrae, or at last, does not possess a body or a spinous process. Second cervical vertebra, or the axis, has a peg-like odontoid process that projects from the superior surface of the body. Seventh cervical vertebra, or vertebra prominence, is so named because it has the longest spinous process, and the process is not bifid. Characteristics of a typical thoracic vertebra. The body is medium-sized and heart-shaped, the vertebral foramen is small and circular. The spines are long and inclined downward. Characteristics of a typical lumbar vertebra. The body is large and kidney-shaped. The pedicles are strong and directed backward. The laminae are short in a vertical dimension. The vertebral foramen are triangular. The transverse processes are long and slender. The spinous processes are short, flat, and quadrangular and project posteriorly. Remember that lumbar vertebrae have no facets for articulation with ribs and no foramina in the transverse processes. Sacrum. The well, sacrum is a large bone located at the terminal part of the vertebral canal. It has an inverted triangular concave shape. So, the sacrum is made up of five fused vertebrae. First is base. It articulates superiorly with the fifth lumbar vertebra and its associated invertebral disc. Next one is apex. So, it abuses the coccyx inferiorly. Third one is auricular surfaces. It is located laterally on the sacrum and shaped like the outer ear. Each, of, each articulates with the auricular surface of the ilium. Last one is anterior and posterior surfaces. It provides attachment to pelvic ligaments and muscles. And internally, the central canal of the vertebral column continues along the core of the sacrum and ends at the port sacral foramina at the sacral hiatus. So next is coccyx. So the coccyx is commonly known as the tailbone and it is below the sacrum. So it is a triangular arrangement of bone that makes up the very bottom portion of the spine below the sacrum. So the coccyx, the coccyx helps support our weight when we sit. It also serves as an attachment site for tendons ligaments, and muscles. It also functions as an insertion point of some of the muscles on the pelvic floor. Important variations in the vertebrae.
First, the number of cervical vertebrae is constant, but the seventh cervical vertebrae may, may be possessed a cervical rib. The Jurassic vertebrae may be increased in number by the addition of the first lumbar vertebra. The fifth lumbar vertebra may be incorporated into the sacrum. Fourth one is the first sacral vertebra may remain partially or completely separate from the sacrum and resemble a sixth lumbar vertebra. Last one, the coccyx which usually consists of four fused vertebrae may have three or five vertebrae. So good day everyone, I'm here to talk about the back. So the joints of vertebral column. The joints of the vertebral column include the joints of the vertebral bodies. The joints of the vertebral arches, the carnal vertebral joints, the costal vertebral joints, and the sacral joints. These joints bear the body weight when sitting or standing. Adjacent vertebral arches are connected by synovial joints called zygapophyseal or the facet joints. They are formed between the superior and inferior articular facets. These joints facilitate flexion and extension in the cervical and the thoracic spine. They also permit the rotational movement in the thoracic spine. The joints of the vertebral bodies. The joints of the vertebral arches and the carnal vertebral joints the costal vertebral joints and the sacroiliac joints. The facet joints, these joints allow flexion to bend in forward, extension, bend in backward, and twisting motions. So the role of the joints in vertebral column is the joints of the vertebral body are secondary cartilaginous joints. The synthesis, weight bearing, and strength. They are the image of the of the thoracic spine, the joints, the ribs. So the joints of the vertebral column. You can see here the carnal vertebral joint, the costal vertebral joint, having the where the vertebral bodies and the vertebral arches are located, and also the sacroiliac joints, where it's located in the lumbar part. So the so the vertebral column. These joints bear weight of sitting and standing. It gives flexibility to motion. So here's the second topic: the nerve supply of the vertebral joint. The posterior element of the vertebral column is innervated by branches of the dorsal rami of the spinal nerve, while the intervertebral inter disc and related ligament are innervated by various branches of the ventral rami and sympathetic nervous systems. The posterior elements of the vertebral column are innervated by branches of the dorsal rami of the spinal column. While the inner intervertebral disc, the relate and related ligaments are innervated by various branches of the ventral rami and sympathetic nervous system. The spinal nerve branch off the spinal cord to innervate the rest of the body. This complex works of nerve to enable the brain to receive sensory inputs from the skin and to send motor controls for muscle movements. The primary curves of the vertebral column is the vertebral column has four curvatures the, the cervical thoracic, the lumbar, and sacrococcygeal nerves. The thoracic and the sacrococcygeal nerves are primary curves retained from the original fetal curvatures. The cervical and lumbar curves develop after birth and thus are secondary curves. Curves of the vertebral column. 
There are four natural curves in the spinal column, the cervical, thoracic. The curves along the intervertebral this help to absorb the and distribute the stresses that occur from everyday activities such as walking or from more intense activities such as running and jumping. The normal spine has an S-shaped curve when viewed from the side. This shape allows for an even distribution of weight and flexibility of the movement. There are four natural curves in the spinal column, the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, and the sacral curvature. So, this is the, we have here the image of the spinal column, and spinal column, we can say the spinal column. So, it is shaped like an S. So, first here, the cervical from C1 to C7, and then the lower, below the cervical, we have the thoracic, from thoracic 1 to thoracic 12. The lumbar uh, located in below the thoracic, we have the L1 to L5, and, la and the sacral having the sacral 1 to S sacral 5. And the lowest and below that is the kids. Thank you guys. Moving on to the movements of vertebral column. The vertebral column consists of several separate vertebrae accurately positioned on one on the other and separated by intervertebral discs. These are the movements of the vertebral column. First one is the flexion or the anterior movement. Second one is the extension or the posterior movement. The third one is the lateral flexion or the bending of the body to one side or the other side. The fourth one is the rotation or the twisting of the vertebral column. And lastly, the circumduction or the overall combination of these movements. For the muscles of the back, it is divided into three groups. The first one is the superficial muscles where it is connected with the shoulder. The second one is the intermediate muscles which involve with the movements of the thoracic cage. Lastly, the deep muscles are the post-vertebral muscles belonging to the vertebral columns. Now let's talk about the deep muscles of the back. The deep muscles of the back form a broad, thick column of muscle tissues which occupies the hollow on each side of the spinous processes of the vertebral column. The deep muscles of the back may be classified as it follows. For the superficial vertically running muscles, the iliocostalis, longissimus, and the spinalis are, are classified as erector spinae or spinae. For the intermediate oblique running muscles, the semispinalis, multifidus, and the rota rotatoris are classified as transversal spinalis. Lastly, for the deepest muscles, we have the interspinalis and the intertransversari. Let us now proceed to the splenius. The splenius is the detached part of the deep muscle of the back and it consists of two parts the splenius capitis and the splenius cervices. For the splenius capitis, it arises from the lower part of the ligamentum nuchae and the upper four thoracic spines and is inserted into the superior nuchal line of the occipital bone and the mastoid process of the temporal bone. For the splenius cervices, has similar origin but it is inserted into the transverse process of the upper cervical vertebrae. And for the nerve supply of the spinous, all the deep muscles of the back are innervated by the posterior rami of the spinal nerves. We are now in the muscular triangles of the back. 
we have the Ascultatory Triangle and the Lumbar Triangle. For the Ascultatory Triangle, breath sounds may be most easily heard with a stethoscope. The boundaries of the latissimus dorsi, the trapezius, and the medial border of the scapula. And for the lumbar triangle, it is the site where pus may emerge from the abdominal wall. The boundaries are the latissimus dorsi, the posterior border of the external oblique muscle of the abdomen, and the iliac crest. deep fascia of the back or also known as thoracolumbar fascia. The lumbar part of the deep fascia is situated in the interval between the iliac crest and the 12th rib. It forms a strong aponeurosis and naturally gives origin to the middle fibers of the transversus and the upper fibers of the internal oblique muscles of the abdominal wall. Medially, the lumbar part of the deep fascia splits into three lamellae. The posterior lamella covers the deep muscles of the back and is attached to the lumbar spine. The middle lamella passes medially to be attached to the tips of the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. It lies anterior to the deep muscles of the back and posterior to the quadratus lumborum. The anterior lamella passes medially and is attached to the anterior surface of the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. It lies anterior to the quadratus lumborum muscle. Blood supply of the box. Arteries, in the cervical region, branches arises from the occipital artery, a branch of the external carotid, from the vertebral artery, a branch of the subclavian, and from the deep cervical artery, a branch of the costocervical trunk. In the thoracic region, branches arise from the posterior intercostal arteries. In the lumbar region, branches arise from the subcostal and lumbar arteries. In the sacral region, Branches arise from the iliolumbar and lateral sacral arteries, branches of the internal iliac artery. Veins The veins draining the structures of the back from the plexuses extending along the vertebral column from the skull to the coccyx. The external vertebral venous plexus lies external and surrounds the vertebral column. The internal vertebral venous plexus lies within the vertebral canal but outside the dura mater of the spinal cord. Lymph drainage of the back. The deep lymph vessels follow the veins and drain into the deep cervical, posterior mediastinal, lateral aortic, and sacral nodes. The lymph vessels from the skin of the neck drain into the cervical nodes. Those from the trunk above the iliac crest drain into the axillary nodes. And those from below the level of the iliac crest drain into the superficial inguinal node. Nerve supply of the back. The skin and muscles of the back are supplied in a segmental manner by the posterior rami of the 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So the next reporter will be talking about the spinal cord. Spinal cord. The spinal cord is a cylindrical, grayish, white structure that begins above the foramen magnum, where it is continuous with the medulla obligated of the brain. It terminates inferiorly 
and the adult at the level of the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra. Roots of the spinal nerves Each root is attached to a cord by a series of rootlets, which extend the whole length of the corresponding segment of the cord. The spinal nerve roots pass literally from each spinal cord, segment to the level of the respective intervertebral foramina, where they unite to form a spinal nerve. Blood supply of the spinal cord The spinal cord receives its arterial supply from three small longitudinally running arteries the two posterior spinal arteries, and one anterior spinal artery. On the left is the anterior spinal arteries, and in our right is the posterior spinal arteries. The anterior spinal arteries arise from the vertebral arteries, unite to form a single artery, which runs down within the anterior median fissure while the posterior spinal arteries arise either directly or indirectly from the vertebral arteries, run down the side of the spinal cord close to the attachments of the posterior spinal nerve roots. Meninges of the spinal cord The spinal cord, like the brain, is surrounded by three meninges the dora mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. So, my topic, first topic will be all about the back. Uh, it contains three, three topics. First is the cerebrospinal fluid, radiographic appearances of the vertebral column, and third will be the spinal subarachnoid space. So, this is me. Okay, so the purpose of this chapter is to review the basic anatomy of the vertebral column and related soft nervous tissue structures so that the physician will feel reasonably confident to institute. So this will these three drawings you see in the screen are the topics in my fur in the in my first um um, topic like it these three are the contents of my first topic first is the cerebrospinal fluid the radiographic and spinal subarachnoid so these are all drawings these are not photos taken from internet so shout out to my um, classmate that draw these drawings so first is the cerebrospinal fluid photo so uh so the cerebrospinal fluid photo um as you can see this part is what you call the cerebrum this is the what you call the ventricular system this is the spinal cord <clears throat> and second will be the radiographic um photo so right here Oh, right here this is what you call the intervertebral disc this is l5 and this is sacrum <clears throat> and the uh, third one is the spinal subarachnoid so it has many labels but uh, I said uh, I said to my classmate that don't put labels so she can easily draw them. So as you can see, this is my first uh, topic, and this is my main contents. Okay, first of all, let's talk about. I think it's the cerebrospinal fluid. So the cerebrospinal fluid is a clear, colorless fluid. Fluid formed mainly by the choroid plexus within the lateral third and fourth ventricles of the brain. 
So, what is the function of cerebral spinal fluid? How does it circulate? So, actually, I'm going to put a drawing here, but since we have no time, I just leave it blank. So, the function of cerebral spinal fluid is to protect the brain tissue from injury when jolted or hit. Uh, CSF flows throughout the inner ventricular system in the brain and is absorbed back into the bloodstream. So, the fluid circulates through the ventricular system and enters the subarachnoid space through the three foramina in the roof of the fourth ventricle. It circulates upward over the surface of the cerebral hemisphere and downward around the spinal cord. So, just like what I've said, the fluid enters. So, let's go back. Sorry. Just like what I said, the fluid enters the bloodstream by passing through the arachnoid vena into the jugal vein sinuses, in particular the superior sagittal venous sinus. So its main function is to protect the brain tissue from injury when bolted or hit. So cerebral spinal fluid has three main functions: protects brain and spinal cord from trauma. Second is to supply nutrients to nervous system tissue. And third is to remove waste products from cerebral metabolism. So this is a clear photo of a cerebral spinal fluid. So uh, around this spot is what you call the central canal. This spot is the cisterna magna. This is the fourth ventricle this is the lateral this is the third this this brown here this this browns are called choroid flexus and this blue is the fluid this is the cerebrospinal fluid so this is the choroid flexus these browns produce this clear fluid you see Oh, this uh, whole thing you see here is what you call subarachnoid space, this one. So what you see here is an example of a radiographic appearance of the vertebral column. So the views commonly used are the anterior, posterior, and lateral. Radiographic appearance as defined by dictionary is an image produced by radiation, so the x-rays and recorded on it. Radio sensitive surveys such as photographic film or by photographing a fluorosomic image. So, it's, this is the example. So this, this is the vertebral column. Here is the intervertebral disc. This spot is the what you call L5. This is the sacrum. Oh, I, this, sorry, this is the sacrum. Okay, so to my last content will be the spinal subarachnoid space. Um, the subarachnoid space can be studied radiographically by the injection of contrast media into the subarachnoid space by lumbar puncture. Iodized oil has been used with success. This technique is referred to as myelography. Myelography. Okay. So you see here is a drawing of a person sitting upright. If the patient is sitting in the upright position, the oil sinks to the lower limit of the subarachnoid space at the level of the inferior border of the second sacral vertebra. If he, <coughs> sorry, by placing the patient on a tilting table, the oil can be made to gravitate gradually to higher levels of the vertebral column. <coughs> so, this is a photo of myogram position. Myogram position. You can call it myogram position, myogram, myelogram. A normal myelogram will show pointed lateral projections at regular intervals at the intervertebral space levels. This appearance is caused by the opaque medium filling the lateral extensions of the subarachnoid space around each spinal nerve. So, this is a this is what you call a myelogram position.
In a case where there is a lesion of the vertebral column and its surrounding structures like the invertebral cells, ligaments, and other soft tissues, we usually use CT scan and MRI for imaging studies. CT scan and MRI are extremely used to detect lesion of the vertebral column, especially those involving the soft tissue. CT scan can concentrate on the invertebral spaces and reveal the intervertebral disc and transverse slices. While the MRI easily defines the intervertebral disc on sagittal section and shows the interrelationship to the vertebral body and the posterior longitudinal ligament. So these are the following midline structures that are commonly subjected to imaging studies. First, we have the EOP. The EOP or the external occipital protuberance. The external occipital protuberance lies at the junction of the head and neck. If the index finger is placed on the skin in the midline, it can be drawn inferiorly from the protuberance in the neutral groove. Next, we have the cervical vertebrae. The most prominent spinous process that can be felt in the neck is at the seventh cervical vertebrae or the vertebra prominence. So cervical spines 1 to 6 are covered by ligamentum nuchum, a large ligament that runs down to the back and the neck, connecting the skull to the spinous process of the cervical vertebrae. The transverse process are short but easily palpable from the lateral side in the thin neck. The anterior tubercle of the sixth cervical transverse process can be palpated medial to the sternocut sternocleidomastoid muscle and again in the common carotid artery can be compressed. Thoracic and the lumbar vertebrae. The neutral groove is continuous in fairly with the furrow that runs down the middle of the back over the tips of the spines of all thoracic and the upper four lumbar vertebrae. The most prominent spine is that of the first thoracic vertebra. The others may be easily recognized when the trunk is bent forward. Sacrum. The spine of the sacrum are fused with each other in the midline to form the medium sacral crest. So the crest can be felt beneath the skin in the uppermost part of the cliff between the buttocks. Sacral hiatus. Sacral hiatus is situated in the posterior aspect of the lower end of the sacrum, and here the extradural space terminates. The hiatus lies about 2 inch or 5 cm above the tip of the coccyx and beneath the skin of the groove between the buttocks. Coccyx. The inferior coccyx and the tip of the coccyx can be palpated in the groove between the buttocks about 1 inch or 2.5 cm behind the anus. The anterior surface of the coccyx can be palpated with a glove finger in the anal canal. Upper lateral part of the thorax. The back can also be divided into upper and lower thoracic. For the upper lateral thoracic area, here is the scapula. So the scapula has medial border, superior angle, inferior angle, crest of the spine of the scapula, acromion of the scapula. So the medial border. The medial border of the scapula forms a permanent ridge which ends above the superior angle and below at the anterior angle. The superior, um, the superior angle can be palpated opposite of the first thoracic spine, and the inferior angle can be palpated opposite the seventh thoracic spine. Next would be the crest of the spine of the scapula. The crest of the spine of the scapula can be palpated and traced medially to the medial border of the scapula, which it joins at the level of the third thoracic spine. And lastly would be the acromium of the scapula. The acromium of the scapula forms a lateral extremely um, of the spine of the scapula. It is subcontinuous and easily located. Lower lateral part of the back. What is lower lateral part of the back? So it is Lower lateral part of the back is formed by the posterior aspect of the upper part of the bony pelvis, or it is what we call false pelvis, and it's associated gluteal muscles. 
lilac crates. The lilac crates are actually pop paper along their entire length. They lie at the level of the four lumbar spine and are used as a landmark when performing a lumbar puncture. Each crease ends in front of the anterior superior lilac spine and behind the posterior superior lilac spine. So again, each crease ends in front of the anterior superior lilac spine and behind the posterior superior lilac spine. The latter lies beneath the skin dimple at the level of the second sacral vertebra and the middle of the sacral leg joint. Symmetry of the back. So if you want to see symmetry of the back, this is what you need to do. I would share the back as a whole and compare the two sides of reference to an imaginary line passing inferiorly from the external occipital protuberance to a cliff between the buttocks. The posterior vertebral musculature, which mainly controls the movement of the vertebral column and maintains the postural curves of the column, can be palpitated.